Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder to change our world. The very heart of our National Geographic community is of course our National Geographic Explorers. Explorers are cutting edge scientists, amazing researchers, adventurers, filmmakers, photographers, and powerful storytellers. These Explorer Classroom events connect students all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time in addition to all of our usual events. So if you'd like, I can see you right back here tomorrow for another Explorer Classroom. But for today, we're very lucky to be connecting with Meg Lohman, better known as Canopy Meg. Meg is one of my favorite explorers. I think she embodies the spirit of exploration. She's got the coolest gear around and she's got the biggest heart. Many, many years ago, Meg pioneered the idea of studying biodiversity from up in the treetops, but she can't study trees if there's no trees left. So she climbed back down to earth to advocate for conservation. She's basically a real life Lorax, so cool. And today Meg is gonna teach us about her work in rainforests. But before we get to that, I want to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by several student groups and we have almost a thousand additional students registered to participate today. I'm so glad to see so many of you out there. Today our students represent Alabama, Arizona, California, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Iowa, Illinois, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Maryland, Maine, Minnesota, Missouri, North Carolina, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, Nevada, New York, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and Washington, plus Canada, Ireland, India, Peru, Portugal, Romania, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, the UAE, and the United Kingdom. This week on Explore Classroom, we're taking a moment to show our appreciation for teachers across the globe. Your work has never been more important or more apparent. So this Teacher Appreciation Week, we're here to say that we see you and that we thank you for all you do for your students, your fellow educators, and your communities each and every day. So from all of us here at National Geographic Society, thank you, we're proud of you, and we support you. And today, all of my shout outs in honor of Teacher Appreciation Week are gonna be for educators. I invite you to do the same. Give a shout out to your favorite teacher in the chat bar on YouTube. We'd love to see um, all of your support for our amazing teachers. So special shout out to Mr. Weiss, Mrs. Hagen, Mrs. Kimball, Mrs. Midget, Miss Leslie, Miss Kaya, Miss Hines, Miss Burks, Miss Foster, Miss Gupta, Miss Killo, Miss Pretzel, Miss Piper, Mrs. D, Miss Lindsay, Mr. Bachman, Miss Coons, Miss Oates, Miss Jaber, Miss Gotti, Miss Beekman, Miss Stanford, SHS, and Miss Quinones. I'm sorry, Miss Quinones. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. SHS and Miss Q, Miss um, Montgomery, Mr. Yusuf, Miss O'Gorman, Miss Marshall, Mr. Aaron, seventh grade, Mrs. Schlorf all the teachers at American Christian, Cayman International School, Collegio Casa May, uh, Fingarten Elementary, Menara Islamic Academy, North Valley Academy, Northwestern Lehigh, um, Summerwind Elementary, Terrytown Academy, Two Brothers Academy, and the Yuba Environmental Charter Academy. Um, we are so excited to have you all here. Thank you for all you do today and every day. Additionally, Nana O'Brien, if you're out there watching, your grandsons want to wish you a happy birthday. But that's plenty from me. Um, introduce yourself in the chat bar. We'd love to say hi. But now it's time to turn it over to Meg for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Hey, thanks, Celeste. Wow, well, that's fantastic. And welcome, everybody. Today, we're going to climb a few trees. So raise your hand if you ever climbed a tree in your life. Oh my gosh, anybody in my audience, I can't see all of you, but I bet you that lots of you are raising your hand. And so that's my world, the tops of trees. And if you've ever climbed a tree before, then you are technically an arbornaut. You know, astronauts explore outer space and I'm one of the world's first arbornauts, meaning I explore the tops of trees and maybe you do too. So here you can see me in the canopy of the Amazon and I'm gonna share with you today 
today about five secrets of the forest canopy just for fun. So first of all, I thought it was only fair to say that I started my tree climbing career just about a little bit younger than all of you. But when I was in fifth grade, I actually had a wildflower collection, kind of embarrassed to show you this picture because that was a long time ago. And look, I had to make my posters by hand and there wasn't any iPhone to photograph habitats or do cool things like iNaturalist. But long ago and far away, I collected wildflowers, I collected bird nests and snakeskins and put them all under my bed. My mother didn't like that, but it was how I got started as a field biologist. So if you collect things and look at things, maybe you might become a field biologist as well. So my first secret of the day is that to be an arbornaut, you have to have this really crazy toolkit. And because I was one of the first explorers of the treetops, I actually had to invent a lot of the methods. And if you decide to climb trees and do research someday with me, you will get to use all of these methods. So our toolkit today includes, first of all, ropes and harnesses. A long time ago, I actually sewed a harness from um, some seatbelt webbing, if you can believe it. And I took a piece of metal and I welded a slingshot so I could get the rope up in the tree. And with all of that, now we can climb the tallest trees in North America. Here's my student, Anthony, up in a redwood tree. And here's a bunch of us in Taiwan and some of the world's tallest trees. I put a little arrow to the people because they're so hard to see. So that was our first, first tool for getting into the treetops. The second thing that happened was I suddenly started bringing school classes and groups of researchers and we couldn't put 20 people on a rope at the same time so I had to invent something else and we decided what about a trail through the tops of the trees so today we have these amazing things that we call skywalks or canopy walkways or aerial trails and they give a whole group of people a chance to study the treetops this one's in China maybe we have some people out there in China I'm not sure um, and then along the way a few of us decided wouldn't it be great to go over the treetops so some of my French botany colleagues decided they'd take a hot air balloon and from that we developed a little base camp you can see that raft that's being towed across the tops of the trees to rest on those beautiful cardboard trees in Africa and we used inflatables and then along came another couple of researchers at the Smithsonian who said hmm maybe we should have a permanent place in the treetops and so down in Panama they put up the first construction crane for canopies. This is kind of expensive. It costs about a million dollars and there's only 10 of them in the world but the cool thing is you can reach every lizard or every leaf or every ant by being in the bucket of a crane if you so want to study those things. So that's the toolkit. We have five different things. We have the ropes and harnesses, we have the walkways, we have the actual uh, inflatable plus the raft, and then we have this construction crane. So with that, I've been able to study treetops all over the world. Here's my global map. People sometimes say, how many canopies have you studied? And I've actually studied a lot. And maybe later for extra credit, I'll tell you a little bit about the canopies of Antarctica because most kids usually see that dot at the bottom of the map. But you can see that we have forests all over the world. You probably also know we're losing forests all over the world. So it's really, really important to explore these places soon, not later. Um, so secret number two, from that exploration with ropes and harnesses and walkways, we scientists now know that 50% of the species on the land part of our planet live in the tops of trees. And the most amazing part is that out of that 50% of all those species, about 90% have never yet been discovered. So if you are interested in exploring, there's a whole lot left for you to do up in the tropical canopy. A lot of them are insects, so I hope you love bugs. Um, there are millions and millions of insects in the treetops that we haven't discovered yet. And some probably have really important roles as pollinators and maybe as cures for different diseases. But for now, we are busy, busy trying our best to discover these insects before they get endangered or extinct. 
Other creatures are a little easier to see. Probably you all know what this one is, but sloths are pretty cool. And uh, I've been working on sloths for many years with my students. Um, some of them are actually endangered now, but others are not. And I love sloths because they eat leaves and I love leaves. So this big old sloth gets by by eating thousands of leaves a day. And sometimes it comes down like this and even swims through the water to get to its next tree. Um, so the next species, maybe it's a little quiz, here is the commonest species in the rainforest. Does everyone know what it is? This is the commonest species in your backyard. I promise you, it's the commonest species in Central Park and probably the commonest species in the Amazon as well as in the wilds of Madagascar. And I know I can't hear all of you answering me, but it is the water bear and those little tardigrades, you can look them up if you don't know about them, are actually microscopic. You can't see one without a picture like this under a microscope, but they are everywhere where there's a drop of water, in moss, in lichen, on tree bark, on leaves, even down in the ice of Antarctica. So there's a little hint for my map that I showed earlier. So if you want to find something that no one else has ever seen before, I can promise you, you probably have a new species of water bear right in your own backyard. So my third secret about the treetops, we know about the toolkit now, we know a little bit about how many millions of things live up there. The other thing that's amazing to me is that canopies and treetops are really fun for kids. So I've actually been pretty lucky because I could take my kids to work with me and they actually had fun going to work with mom. I always thought, you know, if I worked in a bank and I had to count money all day, maybe it wouldn't be so exciting for my kids. And if I was a surgeon, I'm sure they wouldn't have been allowed to come into the operating room. But because I was a treetop biologist, I always had a lot of kids helping me with my research. This third grade class from Florida, by the way, discovered a new species of weevil, if you can believe it, and they all became published scientists. Even at a young age, you can make new discoveries. And here, of course, are my two research assistants, Eddie and James, who are really great arbornauts helping me since about, gosh, maybe second grade. And so there they are with their harnesses in Belize doing the Jason project and they're on a log in Massachusetts where we did a lot of research in temperate forests. So I think it's a great occupation. If you want to grow up and become a scientist, you can probably share it with lots of kids, not just your own, but other people's kids as well. So there's my fifth, uh, third graders I mentioned earlier. So secret number four is, if you can believe it, I'm really passionate about including a lot of kids in my research. And I've worked with a lot of minority students and a lot of girls. And also I just most recently worked with a lot of kids who had disabilities. And one of the amazing things is that kids in wheelchairs never usually get to become field biologists because everybody tells them they should stay inside. And so I had a grant for the last five summers to take kids who have mobility limitations and teach them to climb trees. And guess what? They were great. They climbed trees in Kansas and Massachusetts. And we even climbed some of those tall trees out in California and Oregon. So the good news is if you're really determined to be a scientist and you think maybe you can't, I promise you, you probably can. And there's lots of ways that we can invent the gadgets and adjust the toolkit so that you might become part of field biology. So that was wonderful for me and wonderful for the students. And they, did, they discovered eight new species of water bear, which was really fun. Um, so my last secret for all of you, and you probably already know it, but trees are essential for your life. If we lose trees, we are toast. We are no longer going to be alive on this planet. So we all have to dedicate ourselves to saving trees. So I thought I'd just show you my most recent National Geographic Explorer project, and that's been in Ethiopia. You can see here how tough it is to walk to the grocery store for these people when there's no more shade left. And so Ethiopia is a country where almost 100% of the forests are gone. There's about 3% left in Northern Ethiopia and you can barely see those little green dots here, which are the forests surrounded by cleared, very dry and um, kind of tough 
land for grazing and for growing crops. But um, the important thing is we have to help everyone in Ethiopia save these trees. And if you can look closely, the last remaining trees are surrounding the churchyard. So the priests are the ones that are saving the trees. And I've been working with the priests in Ethiopia. So here's my little list of homework for everybody. What do trees do for you? Fresh water, medicine, timber, honey, soil conservation, carbon storage, food for all of us, home for pollinators, home for lots of things. I call it Noah's Ark. Um, timber again, because there's so much firewood as well that we need, and spiritual values, as well as things like clean air and climate control. It's a huge list of what trees do for you. So I hope you'll all study up on what trees do and remember to help everybody save trees in your community. Um, so here I am teaching the priests of Ethiopia about their trees because they never had a class like you. They never had a biology class or a National Geographic to ask questions. They actually never even had a computer to go online and look at the forest. So with education, we're able to teach the priests as well as all the kids in the villages how important it is to save the forests of Ethiopia. So success, we're building stone walls, which are really easy to do, and we're saving those church forests and we're planting new trees and all the kids are getting involved in learning about all of those cool bugs and birds and animals that live in their forests. So together as a global project, we can save forests around the world. Couple extra things. I've written a children's book that's in English, but I have to also print it in the language of the kids in Ethiopia. And if you kids are from an industrialized country like Europe or Australia or North America, you probably grew up having books, but here are the kids in Ethiopia at the local high school, and this is the first time they ever got a book in their whole life. So it's pretty exciting to share books with kids that have never had books. And I would encourage you to go online. Maybe you can check out my websites and see a few more pictures about the kids around the world where I work and how we can together help everybody save the trees in their villages, in their countries trees and especially in the rainforest where all of those cool species live. So with that, um, maybe we have a little time for questions, Celeste. Oh, we've got a bunch of time for questions. My question time is my favorite time of the day, but that lesson was amazing. I want to take some time to thank you for that. So cool. Such a pioneer. Slingshots and ropes and skywalks <laughs> and blimps and treetop rafts and cranes and Antarctic exploration. It's just the coolest. Trees are so amazing. They can take you so many places. That's true. Um, for folks watching along at home, we would love to hear what your favorite thing is. Maybe you do a follow-up activity from the family guide or you draw a picture, write a story, produce a video, something like that. We'd love to see it. If you share that with us on Twitter, at Nat Geo Education using hashtag Explorer Classroom, we can sure we can make sure that Meg gets a chance to see all of your awesome tree inspired work. Um, but again, now it's time for questions. So if you're watching along on YouTube, you can send your questions in in the chat bar. We record all of them as they come in, so you only need to send your question one time. If you're up here on screen with me, get ready with a nice loud voice. I'll let you know when it's your turn. But our first question of the day comes to us from Thea T. Meg, Thea is wondering when you climbed your first tree. Oh, what a great question. Probably when I was three, because I used to play in the backyard. And if you can believe it, when I was a kid, I grew up in a very small town, no movie theater, not too much television channels available. So I played outside a lot with my best friends and some of them still are my best friends, and we made little tree forts. I'm guessing probably we were better climbers when we were five or six years old, but I grew up with maple trees and oak trees and some of the trees that maybe some of you know and maybe some of you have in your backyard. And I learned early things like birch trees weren't very strong, so we couldn't climb some of the weaker wood trees, but we could climb the stronger ones like oaks and maples. So good luck if you're climbing trees, be sure to tell your parents so they don't lose you but um it was a fun way to grow up brilliant and when did you make the tr transition to climbing trees professionally 
Oh gosh, do you know, this is kind of embarrassing, but I never knew a rainforest existed all through school. I never learned about them in middle school. I never learned about them in high school. So when I went off to college and I heard there were all these trees in tropical jungles that were down near the equator, I could hardly believe it. And I was pretty lucky that I just on a wild notion got a scholarship to go to Australia as a student um, to do my graduate work. And so that's when I first saw my tallest trees. I looked up and I couldn't see the top. And I learned that foresters had been studying trees for a hundred years by just looking at the bottom. And the only time they saw the top is if they cut it down, which seemed really nasty. And so I thought maybe there would be a way I could climb a tree and be friendly and not cut it down. And that's what caused me to weld that first slingshot and make that first harness. It was in Australia and I was about 20 years old. So cool. Well, let's take a question from an on-screen student. It looks like Aaron has a question. Aaron, let me turn on your microphone and go ahead, ask your question with a nice loud voice. So what, when, you, when you went to Australia, what made, instead of like, why, would, why did you go there? That's a great question. Sometimes I ask myself that, why did I go there? Well, here's what happens. When you go off to college and graduate school, it's actually kind of expensive. So you either have to save your money or maybe work a part-time job or maybe both. But in this case, in Australia, they had scholarships for students from other countries that made it totally free to go there. So I made an application and I was really lucky that I got accepted. And to tell you the truth, I was kind of scared, but I wanted to see tropical trees because I had learned actually from National Geographic when I looked in the magazine in high school that nobody had explored them before. So it was a real mystery. And I figured if I wanted to study trees, I should probably pick some trees that no one had ever explored. But holy cow, I also thought would be really fun to see a koala bear too. So I did get to see koalas in Australia, but I saw a whole lot of other things as well as just koalas up in the tree. So amazing. We've got a question from Alice L about things you've seen in trees. Meg, what is the most unusual thing that you found in the treetops? Oh my gosh. You know, the most surprising thing to me is occasional snakes. The vine snake in Belize in Central America, the flying snakes in Malaysia, where I'm working now, that can actually kind of navigate between tree trunks. So it always amazes me. But for the most part, in a place like Australia, where, for example, 96% of the snakes are venomous on the ground, no snakes were venomous in the canopy of Australia. So that was kind of nice. But that's my biggest surprise is to see a few snakes in the canopy. But the other things I love, and I've been very close to both koalas and sloths. They're not afraid of people. I have been close to monkeys, but sometimes they get a little angry. I think they don't want me coming up there and maybe eating their food or something, but sometimes they throw branches at me. But it's really amazing to be in the canopy because most of the animals aren't really scared of you. That is so cool. We've got kid conservationists who's wondering about some of your favorite things. Do you have a favorite place that you've been to study trees? And do you have a favorite animal that you found while, while up in treetops? Sure. So if I would wave a magic wand and take all of you to the rainforest tomorrow, I think I would take you to the Amazon. And that's because it has the most diversity and it's the biggest rainforest left in the world. Now I go to Peru. You can go on my website, Canopy Meg. I'm leaving next July 23rd, 2021. We had to cancel it this year just for a week. I take a lot of families and kids to the rainforest because we're still discovering new things. And I think it's really important to go to a rainforest where you can see lots of new things, not just all the old things. And so the Amazon is still one of the most unexplored places. Uh, what do I love in the canopy? Well, actually, I'll show you one little thing. Here's 
something I just got back from the Amazon a few months ago, but you can't see much of it, but it's a new species of beetle. And I know that looks kind of boring because it's just brown and shiny, but guess what? It eats bromeliads. That beetle, if you see that uh, screen still with me standing on a bridge, it was right in that bromeliad over my head in that picture. And actually the same place is right behind me in my green screen here that I'm talking from. So these cool things are up there eating leaves by the millions. So I'm always fascinated to see that. And my other secret thing that I do love are seeing, of course, scarlet macaws in the Amazon and crimson rosellas in Australia. Some of the most colorful birds in the world live up in the canopy. And it's really, really exciting to see them and be with them in their branches. It's gonna be pretty hard to beat that. All right, let's take a question from Samara. Samara, let me turn on your microphone. Okay, so have you ever been to the Sun Sundarbans in Bangladesh because they have some of the biggest mangrove trees? In what was that called again? Because it skipped out. Sundarbans in Bangladesh. Um, oh, in Bangladesh, you know, I have not been to those exact places, but I have been to some of the larger mangroves that are close by in Thailand and in northeastern India and in Vietnam. And I can tell you, they are so beautiful. And I'll also tell you that mangrove trees are my hardest trees to conquer because they have all those crawly roots on the uh, water's edge and they're really hard to walk through and they're not always tall enough to put a rope up. So we've built some boardwalks through mangroves to try to access the mangrove canopy, but it's a big challenge. And I hope maybe you'll grow up and help me with the mangroves because we still have a lot to explore in the mangroves around the world. And they are so, so important for every coastline in tropical areas. Even down here in Florida, mangroves are critical for hurricane insurance. Love that. Meg, we've got kind of a, a 10,000 foot, very, very general question for you. How do you define a rainforest? Oh, right. Great question. So technically, rainforests do have over 60 inches of rain a year. And the true rainforest of the kind that we find near the equator are forests that have plant families that evolved in tropical conditions, meaning warm, hot, and humid. Um, so those are the rainforests people associate with tropical rainforests, subtropical. Technically, there are rainy forests. The forests of the Pacific, like Oregon and Washington, are rainy forests because those trees did not evolve in tropical conditions, but they live in wet places. So the true rainforests have lots of water, a very moderated climate all year round, and plants that evolved under those conditions. Awesome. We've got Bryson online who's wondering about how some of your gear works. So the rope and slingshot is pretty straightforward, but how do you get up on to a skywalk and how do you get up onto one of the treetop rafts? Sure. Oh my gosh. How fun is that? Well, you can look at some of my YouTube videos later if you like, um, but for the walkways, there's two things. We like to try to build them out when there's a little slope. And then we can allow people in wheelchairs or maybe people that are uh, have walkers, senior citizens or any people that might have any disability to access the walk. And if we can go out and then come back in a circle, we can allow all kinds of people to access the canopy. Sometimes we use stairways because if there's no, if it's very flat, for example, in the Amazon, we have to use stairwells and allow people to get up that way. And we can usually hoist people who are handicapped up with a um, some kind of a seat or do something to help them out. But stairwells is one way. And occasionally we have ladders. A few very rough walkways have rope access, but those are not for the public. They're not so friendly for the public. And for the raft, well, guess what? 
climbing up. Sometimes I climb about 200 feet on a rope to get to the raft when it's in the canopy. But other times we can actually take off when the raft is vaulted up from the ground and the hot air balloon is going to pull it into a new place. We can, a few of us, we can only have about six people at a time can be inside of the raft to take that fantastic ride. I feel a little bit like the Wizard of Oz. Maybe I'm Dorothy or something. So those that give you a little bit of idea, there's a great film that National Geographic used to have. I don't know if it's still around, Celeste, called The Heroes of the High Frontier. And it shows me working in the raft in the canopies of French Guiana. It was really a blast to make that film. Amazing, so cool. Let's go to Bella and Jonathan for a question. Your microphone's on, nice and loud for us. Which amphibians have you found in the rainforest? What was that? Which amphibians have you found in the rainforest? Oh my gosh, what a great question. Do you know we just finished studying amphibians in the, those are the dry tropical mountain forests of Ethiopia. So we found a lot of things. We haven't even identified everything yet, but what we did find is in those stone walls that we're building to save the trees, all of the frogs and the snakes and the lizards love to go inside of them. It was just fantastic. So for the most part, um, we find just about everything. And probably you're more familiar with a few things like the poison dart frogs that climb up in the Amazon and they actually lay their eggs in those bromeliad tanks. They are amazing. And I've seen them at about 100 feet high, which is really, really cool. And um, then I've seen them back down on the forest floor because they oftentimes go return to the forest floor. So it's pretty incredible what's there. My other um, interesting, as far as reptiles and amphibians, if you'll allow me to talk about both, but um, I have seen some anacondas and that's pretty cool too. The local people in the Amazon where I work know so much about their local wildlife. And if you say, hey, Guillermo, I'd like to find an anaconda, they know right where the little bubble of water is actually a snake underwater. It's pretty cool. The local people are our best field guides that we could ever, ever have. Maybe you'll grow up and become a herpetologist and come to the rainforest with me. Love that. Thanks, Jeff. If he doesn't take you up on the offer to come to the rainforest with you, I certainly will. <laughs> um, but we've got Becky Lee online who's wondering about that uh, farm project you were talking about. Are there certain lessons you've learned or specific trees that are particularly helpful for reforming uh, agricultural practices and landscapes? Um, sure, yes and no, because the most important thing always is to plant native trees and they are different every time we work in a different place. So in the case of Ethiopia, we're really careful. We're working now with a separate group to make nurseries so that the local women and children can perhaps have employment to grow seedlings, but it has to be their native species. And there's a real temptation sometimes to bring in things like eucalyptus from Australia that grows fast, but it's not native and the local birds and insects can't live in the canopies and the leaves are very toxic for the soil. So it's always important to plant natives. Now, when I worked in Australia, I worked on a lot of outback uh, areas that had been cleared and we were planting forests and there we needed to plant eucalyptus. And the people always wanted to plant pines because they thought, oh, it would look just like Canada or North America. And we had to say, no, 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 because the local species in Australia needed the eucalyptus. So always plant native. And the most important lesson is if you can save the big trees before they get cut down, that's another important thing. So in our farm areas in Ethiopia, we're trying now to save those big trees that are still left rather than just letting them get cut down and starting from scratch. Amazing. And is there a place that you would recommend people go if they're looking for native trees? Is there like a reputable plant thing online somewhere? Um, well, of course, it's different everywhere. So that's the problem. So if you're so lucky to live in a country that has a field guide to the trees of North America, a field guide to the trees of Maryland, or a field guide to the trees of 
Canada. Um, I have a field guide to the trees of Malaysia, of course, because I'm working there now. So you always need to work with the locals. And that would be one of my other lessons in life is nothing can really happen in a global sense until we develop trust, um, not just lists of species or publications, but working with the local people and developing friendship and trust is really important. And usually you will learn from them what they have observed growing and their grandparents observed growing. And so there isn't one particular source, Celeste, but there certainly are plenty of levels of um, places you can go. And now the United Nations, of course, has what we call red lists of the endangered trees of different areas and a lot of times we try to focus on replanting things that are becoming rare just so that the wildlife will have them back in the fields again. That's amazing. Thank you. Let's go to the Simmons family for our next question. I'm turning on your microphone. Perfect. Go for it. So I had a question about how you identify animals you find in the canopy like, how do you find a specific animal? That is a great question. And I'm just writing a book right now. I hope you'll read it next year when it's published called The Arbor Knot, where a lot of it's talking about how in the heck does a scientist really do anything when you're dangling off of a rope? So that's a great question. A couple things that are important. And one is probably what you're doing already in your school work, in your childhood, in your adulthood is learning to observe and using your five senses really helps because when I go into the canopy, it's like a needle in a haystack to find something like this crazy beetle that's eating the bromeliad. But over time, I learn to find the signs. So I'm really a detective. I'm looking for holes in leaves. I'm looking for little bits of insect poop, believe it or not. I'm trying to find things where I can see change. Sometimes it's a whole epidemic of something. Other times it's birds feasting on caterpillars and I need to get up there and find them. So I learned to find the signs of where different species are. And then when I have my little vial here, I have my beautiful little necklace that I call a pooter and I can put insects in a vial while I'm hanging on the tree. I have to then say, is this a new species? or not. And with a lot more years of experience, um, a couple things have become very clear. One is if you're in the canopy, chances are it's new. But the other thing is oftentimes I mail my specimens to experts, maybe at the Smithsonian or maybe at the museum in uh, Sydney, Australia or the museum in London, because there are certain scientists that just spend their whole life looking at every bug and telling me which one is new. Whereas I'm what we call a field biologist or an ecologist and I look at the whole system out in the field and make the collection. So a lot of times I'm partnering with beetle experts or maybe partnering with moss experts to see if it is a new species. And sometimes I don't know it until maybe a year later. I might think it is because I've never seen it before, but sometimes I have to get it confirmed by some experts. Does that, I hope that helps you a little bit. Super helpful, love it. Um, Uma A online is wondering about the water bears. You said that we could find them in our gardens. How does that work? Everyone, and look, I have my favorite one here, but it's a stuffed one. And guess what, they're not blue. As I said, probably 20 could fit on your little finger. But we collected with my wheelchair students, 55,000 collections and at least 80% had a water bear in it. It probably 100% did, but we just weren't good enough under the microscope to find them all. But water bears love moisture. And if it dries out, they just roll into a ball and they're there in a ball and wait for the moisture to come back again. What you don't know is exactly what's there because you have to get a microscope to see them. So if you were so lucky as to have a microscope, you might be able to collect a little piece of moss or a little piece of lichen or maybe a leaf that's moist and look at it under the microscope. Maybe you wash 
the leaf off and put the water in a little dish under the microscope. And lo and behold, you'll probably find a couple things like little nematodes and little tiny mites and probably a water bear. So if you go online and look at water bears, you'll probably come across quite a few instructions about how to find your own water bears and look at them yourself. But it does take um, magnification. It takes more than just a little tiny hand lens that your mom might have in the kitchen. It takes a little bit more powerful um, to look at these tiny dots that turn to be little swimming things. They have four pairs of, they're not really legs, they're sort of claw-like appendages that just help them kind of navigate as they float through the water. But I tell everybody this, sorry about this mom and dad, but probably we're, nobody's a vegetarian because I'm sure they're all over our lettuce and our broccoli and cucumber. So we just get a little protein every day from all those extra water bears. <laughs> Love that. I have to go out and get myself a microscope now. That sounds like a blast. I want to, want to go find my own. We've got Kate H who's wondering what the most biodiverse forest you've ever been to is. Okay, so that would be what's behind me in my little green screen, as we call it, which is the Amazon. And that's the forest where I mentioned I take people every July because it's so truly life changing for every 10 species of bird in Costa Rica, there's a hundred of the same family in the Amazon. It's so biodiverse. And the second most biodiverse would be going across the Pacific Ocean to get to Southeast Asia. Malaysia um, and some of the areas around Indonesia are also incredibly diverse. Unfortunately, they're being cut down for palm oil, which is very disappointing. But as you probably know, a lot of per Peru and Brazil are also being cut down. The Amazon is being clear cut for things like soy and of course burned for farming. And so it's very, very very scary time to try to hurry up and make good discoveries in the forest and also make policies to help people understand how important it is to save their trees. Brilliant. We've got Rhonda who's wondering if you have a favorite piece of equipment. Oh my gosh. Well, I loved my slingshot. I have to say there's other substitutes now. There's a, a big one called a big boy that you actually, it's about four feet high and you pull back a giant rubber and it can go over a very tall tree. Um, so, I, you know, that whole business of rigging the trees for ropes is really fun. But if I had to pick my favorite method, it would definitely be the walkway because you can take children, you can take babies, you can take elder people that have walkers and people with wheelchairs. I love the fact of being inclusive. And also with the canopy walkway, guess what? I studied a tree called the giant stinging tree, which as you can imagine was so toxic. I couldn't climb the tree with a rope or I'd get stung and I couldn't put the balloon on top of it or it would get stung. But if we had a canopy walkway going near the tree, we could study things like that. So the canopy walkway is really useful for studying some things that are a little tough to work with using other other methods. But Amazing. thanks for asking. Todd is wondering what the tallest tree you've ever climbed is. Oh my gosh. Probably redwoods, but here's three. They're all about 300 feet. The redwoods, the fantastic dipterocarps, there's a big name for you. The dipterocarps in Malaysia are the tallest trees in Asia. And then some of the gums, some of the snow gums and the uh, Australian gums are also equally tall. In the Amazon, a little shorter, but still about 250 feet tall would be the great Kapuk tree. So every country seems to have what we call an emergent. That's the level of canopy above everything else. And in fact, the picture behind me was photographed from an emergent tree in the Amazon, because you can see the pictures a little bit above most of the canopy. And those are the super tall trees where all the birds love to go and roost and all of the everything else like humans like to go so we can see what's living up there. Amazing. We've got Finn online who's asking the question on a lot of people's mind. Finn J wants to know what kind of trees are in Antarctica that you were studying down oh, there. Right. I almost forgot. So that's kind of a joke because I study canopies and canopy technically 
is the foliage area of a plant. So in some trees, the canopy goes from about five feet to 300 feet. In other trees, it goes from about 200 feet to 300 feet because the tree is like a lollipop shape. Um, but technically, even corn has a canopy, which is about two feet high. So I did do research and my son James also did research on these wonderful water bears again in Antarctica. And they live in the canopies of moss and lichen. So we kind of joked that maybe we could make a little toothpick canopy walkway for the water bears to move around in the moss and lichens. But the incredible thing is even in that very cold country, if you sample the little bits of vegetation that have moisture, you'll find those water bears or tardigrades just having a good old time down there in Antarctica. So that's not really a tropical or a tall tree canopy site, but it's a canopy site. So that's kind of fun. Amazing. Alexander P. is wondering what they can do as a student to protect forests. Oh my gosh, so much. Well, first of all, you're doing it. Thanks for being a great student today and listening in. The more you can learn about rainforests and the more you can memorize that list of 10 things that trees do for you and tell everyone, tell your sports team and your Sunday school and your schoolmates and your people in the grocery store. Everybody needs to know how important trees are. But in addition to learning about it, you need to protect big trees in your community. There's really no excuse for killing our senior citizens. Um, and most roads can move and most buildings can be adjusted or have a courtyard. And most people don't really need to cut down a big tree. They can build their house around it or next to it. So try your best to make sure that your community is very aware of big trees. And if you need more trees, plant trees, that's an important thing to do. And then the other thing is if you live in a country that's relatively wealthy, um, you should be very careful about your shopping and you need to know that it's because people buy things that come from the rainforest that the rainforest is being cut down. Have your parents and your teachers buy shade grown coffee, which means it's grown under the shade of the canopy, not coffee that's grown in the sun after the canopy was cleared. Make sure that people buy soy and beef and oranges and other fruits and things that are not coming from Brazil or Malaysia, that they're coming from maybe Iowa or Kansas or somewhere like that where the trees had already been cut down. And also for timber, don't buy timber from the tropics, heaven forbid. Once in a while, there's a sustainable timber rating for a tropical tree, but it's really hard to know which is which. You might be better off buying pine from Canada or doing something where the restoration of the forest is a lot easier and a lot quicker in the temperate zone. So it is our shopping that's affecting the rainforest in a big way. And last but not least, write your grocery stores, go to the manager of your grocery store and say, please put a label on everything. If you don't have labels on the coffee, if you don't have labels on the soy, people buy it and they don't realize it's gonna be killing their children. They buy it by mistake. So we need to have a lot better ability of knowing what we're buying. So good luck. Kids have a better influence on politicians than adults do probably. Love that. Owen, who's eight years old, has a great question. Meg, is it scary when you're way up in the tree up high? Uh, that is a good question. Do you know, I, I call it a respect for heights. I'm not a daredevil, and I think that's why I'm still alive, because in some ways, if you get a little bit too bold, you might make a mistake. So I always have a little fear if it's windy or if it sounds like a thunderstorm is coming or something like that. But mostly it's just plain wonderful. And the only time I ever fell, it's in this book called Life in the Treetops. Maybe some of you have read it um, or you could order it. But I did fall only about 15 feet from a gum tree in a Australia because of human error. I forgot to clip myself on. So it's like riding a bike. You need to use safety first and then you should be fine. But I always just want to be extra careful when I'm up in a tree because I'm not a monkey. I wish I had a tail, but I don't. Love that. Well, Meg, do you have any advice for all of the young explorers out there watching today? Gosh, well, I would say play outdoors. If you have any excuse, 
or ability to go outdoors, even if you live in the middle of a big city, it's amazing what you can find in a sidewalk crack, or maybe you can see the few odd trees in a city park, or look at what kinds of succession is going on in the soil at the edge of a parking lot. So always develop your ability to be an observer if you're going to be an explorer. And who knows, one thing will lead to another. You don't have to be a star athlete to climb a tree, look at me. And uh, you don't have to be some kind of superstar in school to become an arbor knot because we need so much exploration. We need all of you and all of your brain cells. So just use those five senses whenever you can. I love that. And Meg, as you know, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. So for the final question, uh, is there a teacher out there that's really inspired you or helped you get to where you are today? I love it. And happy Teacher Appreciation Week to all of you teachers. I'm so proud of you because I know you're going through a lot of extra hoops right now to make sure your kids are learning. I'd love to give a shout out. Believe it or not, two of my best teachers were in summer camp, um, not in school. And I was so lucky to go to a summer camp that was operated by a school in Alexandria, Virginia called Burgundy Day School. And it was the first nature camp in the country, believe it or not. And John and Lee Trot taught me to bird watch, to find moss, to be quiet in the woods so I could hear everything. And I'm just always so grateful to them. And the other thing I would just say is, if you can believe this, I never had a woman science teacher through all of my schooling. So a little shout out for women teachers and for girls who might grow up to be Arbornauts because when I was young, I always thought that girls couldn't be scientists. So that made me pretty shy when I was in science class. But I think now things are changing and everybody can be a scientist. And a shout out for the boys too. I have two boys and I'm always happy when there's wonderful boys and girls in science. So thanks for all you teachers. Amazing. Well, for everyone watching along at home, you can check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources online at natgeoed.org. I hope to see you at some of our upcoming events. You can tune in at 2 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow, so that the same time for Hidden Plastic with Imogen Naffer. And now it's time to turn on everybody's microphone, nice and loud. Let's say goodbye and thank you to Meg. Ready? Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>